injection of life. And oh. You feel it? Good. Good. Too powerful. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna really hook in fast. Go. Uh, this uh, this morning because I started putting this together and it ended up being just rich. Well, not rich. I mean, a lot. And I don't want us to miss any of it. But I want to begin by reading to us something from Secrets of Heaven, Volume 3. And the context is where Abraham has to send Hagar away and the child that she's had. Really a very gripping human story. Really almost breaks your heart. Even Abraham was very disturbed by it. But the Lord said, Abraham, don't be disturbed. The woman and her child will be okay. Now, in the deeper spiritual sense, what Swedenborg shows us is that what's happening inside us here is when we become the teenager or somewhere around that part in our life and we begin to develop our own rational thinking. Or what, irrational. Well, it, it starts out to be a form of rational. Yeah. It is still irrational in a lot of ways yeah. compared, to, compared to true spiritual maturity. Yeah. Oh, yes. What does Hagar do? He becomes a man who fights with everyone. What do often, you know, the first signs of rational thinking in teenagers do? Oh, they kick against all the adults in their life and, oh, I'll make my own decisions. That's, that's Ishmael and Hagar, his mother, is the desire to want to have truth for yourself. But that will become, as we grow up, Isaac inside us. That will be the promised birth. Not just a rational, but a spiritually rational person that, that sees the big picture, Trevor. Not just the me picture, but the yeah. big, big picture. But we all go through that phase, don't we? We all pass yeah. through it. So in the story side of it, Hagar is sent away. And then very quickly, she runs out of water. She thinks she's going to die and the, son, the child's going to die. So she puts the child under a tree so, and moves away a bit so she doesn't have to hear her crying, thinking, I'm not going to cope. Then she cries out to God. And then the Lord answers her, opens her eyes, and she sees a pathway to a waterhole. It was there all along, but how often we don't see the pathway because of our distress. <laughs> We're distressed by something that's happening to it, we don't see that. So he opens her eyes, she sees the pathway, and there's hope. Now Swinburne says here, in, in talking about this and unpacking it, he says here, those... Had the page, I promise. Okay. Put the bookmark there. Maybe I've gone back to. Stress stops us from seeing the path. It's true, isn't it? It's it so works true. every time. It's really it works good. every time. Yes. Yeah. All right, I'll go back. It's, it's here. Thank you for your patience. That's right. Don't no stress. Ah, the water from the flask was used up, and she put the boy under one of the shrubs. That's what it says here. And so we explaining it says, those who are being reformed, they're coming out of their Ishmael into their Isaac, those who are being reformed are first reduced to ignorance. Have you ever felt that way in your spiritual life where you, I've got this. And then you go a bit further and you go, no, oh no, man, I don't have no, this. No, 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 <laughs> I really no. thought I understood it and I really don't understand it. So first, we're reduced to ignorance. And Buddhists talk about this a lot. They say enlightenment is primarily destruction because the ego is being destroyed. What, what we held onto and thought we knew and understood is being destroyed. But there's more beyond the destruction of the rebirth. So it goes and say that those who are being reformed are first reduced to ignorance, even to a state of despair, at which point they receive comfort and enlightenment. Oh, God, is this one? That's all right. Comfort and enlightenment. And it is clear what then follows. For the light of truth from the Lord cannot flow into our persuasive thinking. Isn't that interesting? It just can't come into our thinking. But it goes on to say, our persuasive thinking that originates in the ego. Indeed, its nature is such, the ego, 
as to extinguish the light of heaven. In the next life, that persuasive thinking presents itself as a light in winter. But with the approach of the light of heaven, we realize it is a kind of darkness consisting in ignorance of all truth. And it takes place in the wintry light. So did Christmas too by the time and Jesus was found under a, a dark night, a dark light. This is the bit that I really want to get to. This state with those who are being reformed is called a state of desolation of truth. And he goes on to say, and it is also frequently the subject of the internal sense of the word. So whenever we're dealing with the word, most of what its deeper spiritual message is about is about showing us showing us how to actually combat our ego, work through its death and destruction, and have the resurrection of the heavenly ego, the new self made in the image and the likeness of Christ, the angel. And that's just such a powerful thing because right now we're going to look at, I thought we'd finish the year by looking at probably you know, one of the most obvious parables that Jesus says, and I would say to a lot of fundamentalist Christians, if you take the Bible literally only, show me the people who've cut off their hands and poked out their eyes. I know no one. I know no stories of anybody who's ever, I mean, I'm not, you know, if, if they did, you'd go, wow, what, a, what an amazing conviction that they felt so strongly to cut off their hand or foot or poke out their eye. No, the Lord spoke in spiritual language. He always did. And when we realize that, it helps lift us up out of our distress. And suddenly we see that pathway and we find that refreshing water that we were so longing for. So let's begin. The offensive foot and the offensive eye. Russell, would you mind reading for us that first bit of sacred text? Careful about that one. That is our only best, best uh, microphone. Yeah, yeah. And I dropped it. Don't, 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 yeah, don't, don't, don't destroy it. I will not destroy it. <laughs> now, Russell, would you read that bit passage for us there? Woe well, unto the world because of offences. For it must needs be that offences come, but woe to that man by whom the offence cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Wow, and, and to pre precursor this, I'll give you the context. The verses before it, the disciples had just seen the Lord do an incredible miracle. And you think they would get it. You know, his power, his providence. Peter, he says, uh, go and catch a fish. You'll find a coin in its mouth and pay our taxes. I mean, that's... And he did. Peter caught the fish and found a coin. <clears throat> but no, the disciples like us are slow to learn. We're so slow to learn. They begin to say, who's going to be the greatest out of us? <laughs> Not understanding the nature of heaven is about love and service. Well, who's going to be the greatest? And then Jesus, knowing them, says, come here. Bring me a child. Puts a child on his lap and says, the kingdom of heaven is like a child. Suffer the children to come to me. You know, so children represent that willingness to trust God and to be led. When all the distress and all the nightmares are going on in your life, you turn and you trust God that he has an answer for you, he has a solution for your problems. So that's, but he said, how terrible for someone who offends one of these little ones. And then he does his teaching about offense. And he's teaching us we need to take care of our soul. Okay? No, you, no one will go and drink water that has manure or poo or shouldn't, you know. Well, we're careful to, to drink clean water and good food, but what are we putting into our souls? And the Lord's saying, be careful what you put into your souls. So that's kind of the context of what is going on. I'm going to race through this introduction just, so that we have time. Just oh, yes, please go in, yeah. I got interested in the word offence. Offence? 
Makes me think you've never been on a bushwalk with your, your mates and you're a kid and the one in front of you pulls the branch back and that's lets it. it go on you and laughs. Yes, that's <laughs> and you're like, that really hurt. <laughs> but it's done in a very vindictive sort of, yeah. Yeah, it's just interesting. That's fascinating, Eden. Ian. Yeah. Well, I did look that word up years ago, scandalon or scandalos or scandalon or something, and it means, yeah, a scandal, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Any other interruptions? I'm happy that I love interruptions. No, I do. I, I love them. Any other thoughts before we move on? I've got one thought. Yes. Uh, I've got a friend who we talk about scriptures and stuff. Yep. And he's always saying, well, uh, he can, he, he's like a black and white person where he says, it's either black or white. This, this, and he said, well, this seems to contradict this one. Yep. Uh, but what I've tried to say to him is it's not a case uh, contradiction, it's a case of there's inner meaning, says the general meaning, Beautiful. the meaning, the spiritual meaning, the celestial meaning. Yes. So when we look to think and say these things contradict each other, it's uh, they don't on a spiritual and celestial level. So what I say to them is don't worry about things which seem to contradict. God's trying to say, well, if you can have this understanding, that's fine. And it might change in the future to a better understanding. Oh, or a that's one. beautiful. But it's, wow. you know, so we always have to look at the scriptures and say, well, it's speaking to us on this level, but maybe it will speak to us on a different level. A diff but on the way driving in, I was you know, rolling this over my, my mind and I thought, so often, any Christian or spiritual person will acknowledge there are there are two parallel paths that we're walking always at, at any time. There's our external life, and then there's our inner life, isn't it? You know, anybody who's awake is aware that there's these two paths moving together parallel. And I was meditating on this and thinking, a lot of what we're looking at today is about when you go deep enough, a third passage opens up for you above even the first one. So the, the, the main passage is my external life and, and am I okay, doing okay? And then my inner life, am I doing okay? What do I have to do? Well, love the Lord and love the neighbor. Yeah, okay, I can do that. And we work on that. But this third layer that opens up as we go deeper, what I found is it's a pathway that actually makes me fall in love with the Lord. Do you see what I'm saying? It's that celestial. Why? Because as the layer is peeled away and I see him, oh, that was you, Lord. That was you. See, when you were talking about the Lord being the little children, on the highest level, it's talking about innocence. So, Absolutely. You know, so on the celestial level, yes. uh, God is saying we have to have that innocent quality, and that's what children represent. And anything, be it your hand or foot or eye, that blocks that innocence, we must cut it off. Yeah. Not literally, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's that innocence, that anything that's stopping you from trusting him. How hard is it to trust him when your world is falling apart? It's the hardest. Easy to trust him when you know you won the lotto and everybody likes you and, and, and you're somebody. But when your world's falling apart, that's when trust really, if you really have it or not, that's when it shows up. So let's plow, interrupt me at any point, let's plow through the intro quickly so that we can get to the meat of the word. Introduction, the nature of reality is such that pathways open before us based on our heart's desires. Sacred text encourages and warns us concerning this very principle. Quote, see, I have placed before you this day life and good, death and evil, in that I command you this day to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. So we always have those two paths before us. So what's a statute? He's got commandments and statutes. The principles. Statutes of principles. First principles, yeah, which are love the Lord and love your neighbor. So ten commandments, but you can sum them up in the principles of love the Lord and love the neighbor. Yeah, statutes, yeah, no, that's a good question. So when, when we 
when we choose that to do that and love that, a pathway of multiplication opens up for us. So the Lord has taught us that to know our heart, we need only pay attention to our words, the things we speak of and the way we communicate. This is such a good one for me. I'm always watching my words. They tell me a lot about where I'm really at. Quote, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. Oh, you generation of vipers or snakes. What do they do with their mouths? They bite. They bite you. And you know anyone who always bites you? <laughs> anyone that's always snapping at you? You generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. Evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth scandals, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now we know what the judgment is. I'm going to interrupt there and say the judgment is when we leave the body and we enter the light of heaven and we review our life in the light of heaven. Not our own proprium, but in ego, but the light of heaven. That is a judgment. And we're hardest on ourselves. Believe me, it's not even God being hard. It's we're hardest on ourselves. But there are many people that run from that light. They won't enter into that light and let themselves see themselves. He goes on to say, in that day they shall give account. Uh, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Proverbs 18.21 also warns us of the fruit of such hidden power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. The fruit of one's life reveals the nature of the tree dwelling within. Is the heart concealing a tree of life or a tree of death? Paying careful attention to the fruit that we produce is key to spiritual success. Sacred text counsels the soul warrior to guard the heart carefully because it is the source of life or death. When our heart is pure, the light of heaven fills the mind and warms the heart. Uh, uh, the warmth of heaven governs our heart's desires. But when the heart is not pure, and we all have a level of this, we're all at different stages of this. When the heart is not pure, that dormant, furling energy within us has immense power to cloud the mind. Quote, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I find it so easy to see fault in other people and not see the fault in myself, isn't it? It's just too easy to do that. If we can make a practice of not judging others, but excitedly embracing you know, self-examination, not condemnation, self-examination, then we can truly grow. The log in our eyes and the sawdust in this. The log in our eyes and the sawdust in this. That's so well said. I can make a lot of sawdust with a log. <laughs> <laughs> I can make a lot. All right. So all of us begin our spiritual journey in obscurity, but with a measure of natural innocence. Think spiritual archetype of children or inner child. There's that child, Paul. We all start out as the child, but we're also very ignorant as well. And what the Lord wants us to do is to stay a child, but grow up into the wisdom. Isn't that a, what a challenge? It's so easy to grow up into an adult and become bitter. Isn't it? With all the bad things that happen to you know, don't you, Chris, Christina, the, the things that people can do to us. And it's such a challenge to, to stay the child and, and grow up and have wisdom. I'm not going to let you walk all over me, but to not be bitter. That's, that's the challenge. All right, so hereditary selfishness lies dormant in the soul, but quickly it will manifest as we grow and interact with our given communities. The earlier we begin the process of guarding the heart and the little children that dwell there, the stronger our spiritual life can become. Having reviewed the dangers set before us, let us remember that the light and the life of the life and the light of the Lord are tremendous and able to break even the darkest of spells. I like to think of Matthew, Mark, 
Luke and John, the Gospels, as God's spell to break the darkness of all other spells. It's a good one. And love. Mm. Oh, you, you, you should be a Vulcan, you know, emotionless and detached. That's a superior path. No, love. Vulnerability of love is a good path, is the best path. Mm. Vulnerability of love. God's spell, God's spell of love. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to stop. I pushed us hard there. Sorry I pushed you hard to get through the intro. Well, we wouldn't make it through the entire thing. Does anybody want to make a comment before we look at the text now? Any thoughts or comments? This morning, I, I was reading some passage. Uh, that is from the secret of heaven. Mm -hmm. It says, our inner self has only mutual Mutual, mutual, mutual love. Mutual love. Our, our spirit, or our soul, is the intermediate. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is odd because the, the spirit or the soul is living with us while we are in the, this world. Mm -hmm. So the. Our soul or our spirit is our inner inner self. Yet our inner self has pure love, mutual love. I I, I I was a little bit confused. A little bit confused because I was before this I was thinking our soul is our inner life, the inner self. Maybe my my understanding. Is Can I explain that one? Yeah. You're right. Our soul is our inner life. But on the deepest level, the spirit inside everyone is the Lord, even in hell. So the, the inner spirit, the most inner person, is the Lord inside the every Lord. one of us. Ah, oh, okay. It's the Lord, and it is heavenly love. It's mutual love. But our soul is that part of us where the ego comes in and out and fluctuates in and out. And the Lord created the soul because He didn't. He, you know, he wants an eternal family. You could say God is expanding, in a sense, by creating living souls. So at our very core is God. And if he wasn't there, we wouldn't be. Now, it says in the scriptures, Moses, you cannot see me and live. If we stripped away all of the layers until we found the most inner man, we'd find the Lord and we would cease to exist. You cannot see God and live. Does that make sense? Okay. By the way, there is another, another verse, another passage saying that from the inner self. Yes. Actually, we each of us is an angel or a devil. <laughs> well, the, the intention. But we're that, all created. That, Ian, do you want to come on in, lovely people? Welcome, welcome. Come on, grab a seat. We'll move over so you've got enough rooms to sit together as a family. That paragraph is also, I think it is from heaven and hell. Yes. If this the description, I think it is the description is correct. Yeah. Uh, originally, the, the Lord created it us to be an engine, to, to become an engine. That's what it did. So what you've got, we've got a physical body and we have a spiritual body. Yes. So our spiritual body, which is in us, we're either in heaven or hell now, depending on what we love the most. Yes. So in this life, so God wants us all to become angels, and that's by following the Lord, keeping his commandments, serving God. So when we do that, this world is a preparation for us to go to heaven and be an angel. But if we love the things of this world, we love ourselves more than that, even though the Lord wants us to be an angel, if we choose another path, we will choose a path to hell. Therefore, if we're doing evil things, then we are living in hell now. So Even now, so yeah. So it's what we love the most. So our spiritual body is our mind, our thinking, and we either love the Lord or if we love the things of this world. Or, so we have those choices every day. So yes, he wants us to be an angel. But Isn't it interesting the psalm says, where can I go to escape you, God? Even, oh, oh, Christy, I'll let you speak, yeah. Go. No, no, I was interested in what Mine was saying and you didn't finish. Oh, yeah. Because if you read that paragraph only, 
maybe someone who didn't fully understand the writings may criticize. Oh, you say that everyone can become an angel. Right. Right. No. No. But if you if you read the whole message of the Swedenborg's writing, you can know. Okay, we are created to be angel. Yes. From the inner side, from yes. the inner from the self. Yes. We should be an angel. Yes. But whether or not we can be an angel, just like you said, freedom of choice. Yeah, freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. But I, but I think I think many many traditional Christians criticize us, criticize us, saying that we are heresy or something. Yes. I think they didn't understand. Of course. The the whole information. That's well, always the case. Well, even King David says in the Psalms. The sum of thy word is truth. You need the whole or the summary. You can take any passage out of context, and if you take con out of context, all you're left with, if you take, sorry, text out of context, you're left with con. That's all you're left with is a con. So it's, it, it, it's always the way, Guan, we need to keep learning, keep growing, keep reading, keep understanding. Judge not, lest we be judged. When we don't understand something, the right answer is to, like you say, Paul, instead of writing things off, but say, hmm, there's a quest here. The Lord wants me to go deeper to find out what's really going on. And whenever I've taken that challenge up, what, what you discover transforms you in here. It's not just the head, but when, you, when, when the Lord gives you the inner sense, it transforms you in here. And when you said about the Vulcans, I watch the show when I'm feeling down, it's called Banged Up Abroad. It's about people who have got themselves in trouble overseas. Yes. Yes. There's one man who is a Ferrari or Lamborghini salesman, money, money, money. So he strapped on, oh, I'm bad with numbers, we'll say 20 kilos of heroin in, in Thailand. He was so hardened, he didn't really have much emotion really. He was thrown in the back of the, the police van. He was sick, he started feeling, he, the, the policeman let him over and he vomited all over the police officer and he thought, this police officer is going to bash me. Yeah, the police officer did. Patted him on the back and said, it's okay, everything's going to be fine and good. Wow. And he said, this police officer broke me with his kindness. Wow. So he got into the this, this emotionless, money-hungry, ego-driven man by his kindness. But if he was nasty to him, he wouldn't have got to him. And I, I, it, it was very emotional seeing him change just from someone being kind. And there's a lot of stories. If you're feeling down, watch this show, and it'll show you what love can do. These people were so driven by worldly goods, and in the end, they're a complete different person. A lot of them wanted to commit suicide, but they thought they opened the Bible and read something that was, oh wow, I've never read it. And something applied to them. They had all different, one man did yoga that kept him going. And he said, he, all the principles, oh, I guarantee, you watch this show, your life. What's it called? Banged up a broad. Yeah, banged, banged up a broad. Where is it on? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good Where is it on? It's a British one, isn't it? It's a good British one. Uh, I watch it on Voxtel, but it's, uh, it's a National Geographic program. Um, it's it, on it, SBS all the time. It puts your it's life into perspective. I just don't have a TV, that's why I thought well, uh, it's on Netflix or YouTube. You got to probably can find it on YouTube. You've got it on a computer. You, no, know, right, you okay. can find it. But it, it, it's, it, it's it, a one, one boy, he was set up as a drug meal for his father. So he sat there and he read the Bible and it said oh, about a father, a, a son's, oh, I can't remember that, you might know it, a son's, uh, yeah. shouldn't be, along the lines of a son shouldn't suffer from a father's mistakes. Ezekiel, the sins, sins of the, of the fathers. fathers. Yeah. 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 Ezekiel 18, no longer will you utter the proverb, a father has eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth have been set on edge. If the father sins, the soul that sins shall die. The son should not be punished That's for the... Exactly, and the father got so angry because oh. he paid off the guards in this place. He get, I don't want you here because the truth oh. got to him. Oh. And so he didn't want anything to do with his son anymore. Wow. So his son was in the general population, but it was a good thing because it worked out. And he prayed and he got himself out of it. And these stories, honestly, they you think you're going through 
a hard time, but it's good seeing love prevails yes. every time in these stories. That's so good. If you sit there and hate, yep. you won't get anywhere. They wanted to murder the other people, but no, 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 I've got to forgive them. It's, it's, it's stories of forgiveness, love, kindness, and it's, 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 it's very spiritual. Yeah, in, in many ways, sorry, go on, Chrissy. No, it's all sort of theoretical talking about other people. I, I, I want to talk about a situation where I'm trying to help this young lady and part of me is how much do I help in the sense of um, I, I had a relationship with these three triplets with the Pajama Foundation. They were um, in foster care because their own parents had made them available to pedophiles. Now you, oh. couldn't, you couldn't get more horrific than that. So, and, and, uh, but they're now 18. And 19. Then, yeah, just turned 19. But, uh, so I was with them till just before high school. And then one of the triplets made contact with me again. And um, she's trying to find work. And, um, and I sort of wasn't with them during that part where they're going into adolescence. But to uh, try and cut a long story short, um, like, uh, there was an opportunity to help one of the uh, to help them with work. I, I met a gentleman and his daughter who were training dogs for a pause for home open understanding, and they train dogs to help veterans or people suffering post traumatic stress disorder to uh, cope with life because some dogs can even be trained to help people take their remind people to take their medication at a wow. certain time and also the companionship and, and then it sort of can lift you out of yourself if you've got another being. So so uh, I, I asked them, oh, do you... I asked them uh, in the sense of... Uh, Hi, uh, Heidi was doing this um, a voluntary work. I said, uh, do you take volunteers? And they said, yes, we do. And also, I explained a little bit about Heidi's background. I showed her, and she loves animals. She she had a dog um, that died recently, and um, she uh, read me a poem about the dog. But when she went for the inter about the dog, and she was very sensitive about it, when she went for the interview, uh, she didn't hear back. And I checked with her, and I and when I rang Bob, and I said, "Well, how was the interview?" He said, "Well, she didn't seem very enthusiastic." Now, if she's on medication, her affect is very flat. Mm. So, you know, she sort of holds in a lot of emotion. So he's given an opportunity for another interview uh, this coming Tuesday, actually, but he wants me to go with her. But then trying... Um, I've spent this morning trying to um, ask her, well, are you still interested? And she only answers with yes, no, maybe, mm. or... Oh, I've got some birthday presents for you. Oh, uh, when can I give them to you? Oh, next Saturday, because we're busy all the rest of the week. It's like she's still, she doesn't see that you're trying to, you know, you're being generous, but it's like it's all about her and what she's doing. Mm. So, but then uh, there was um, a lady, anyway, uh, about about the affect. So so anyway, I, I've done my best there and <laughs> take it there. But part of it is how much do you help and how much do you suggest things? Um, because when when I mentioned about Heidi to a lady who actually works at the school that Heidi was at, and she works in special ed, mm -hmm. and I just mentioned about oh I'm trying to give Heidi this opportunity, but uh, the feedback was she's um, she didn't seem enthusiastic. And then this teacher got all the fishes at me because I said, I wonder if she needs to be. And this was only an informal, like, you know, two people who know her and just, oh, I can't tell you, blah, blah, blah. Like she took this very, I can't give an opinion about that. Like a not, um, and she was quite nasty to me and I sort of taken very officious and um, it's like made me feel like I'm this guilty person that's somehow somehow this guilt trip on me and yet dealing with that and then also the question 
how much do you help people or how much you know you don't want to push but you want to give the opportunity so anyway I worked it out today where I um, approached Heidi again and, and I got these curt replies but I know deep in her heart that she is interested yes but yes. she doesn't express it and then when I go there do I, I I've already told him uh, about her but do I say to her look we're here again because the impression you gave was that you weren't very interested and I know it's probably because you're not you're on medication do I go that far how how straightforward you know I tend to be straightforward how how straightforward can you be or how much do I sort of be so what, careful about well, what she's I say a very self-conscious shy girl without any other things going on and you've got to deal with that part of her as well sure. sometimes formal interviews don't work for certain people it's like asking someone that's illiterate go and write a book so in social situations we are all so different so yeah it yeah. needs to be more of a that's all talk yeah, theoretical yeah, well, yeah. 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 yeah but this is what i'm uncertain about because she's uh, she was in a straightforward school but both her sisters had to go to a special school mm. but she's not uh, not that literate so whether she herself feels well if because they're saying well you can do dog grooming we can train you and dog training and all that but whether she's then knows her own limitations but doesn't that you know like wants to take advantage of the opportunity but then her own limitations and um, maybe because the other lady who trains went to America and did training you'd have to have a certain level of literacy and there might be a lot of sort of reading and research and stuff like that mm. so maybe she herself feels uh, you know an idea oh yes I want to find work and I could do this but mm. maybe she herself knows her own limitations but doesn't know how to express it mm. and whether I'm helping too much pushing or helping too, too little much or, yeah, when it's that. not perhaps yeah well, I think the answer on all these things is you have a desire to help someone you do as much as you can the other person has to do something but you're saying if they can't articulate their problems then you can represent them I remember a while ago a friend of mine was going to get kicked out of his house but he had hot, you know, he couldn't really speak, so I went to speak for him on behalf of the judge. So in your case, you can say, well, you know, if she can't express herself very well, then you go along to speak on her behalf. But she has to also show you. In all the cases, sure. we help each other, help people, but they've got to do their bit as well. Mm -hmm. do their bit. Prompting them, I guess. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like prompting is like. Well, he asked me to come with her mm. to give her that extra support I said well I know when she talks to me she's enthusiastic about it and, and she shows her emotion but uh, anyway so I, I suppose let's, yeah, let's on that on. dilemma let's move on but let's also yeah. say a quick prayer yes uh, yeah. Lord we lift Christina and this an issue up and we ask that you will just shine that bright green flashing light go 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 in the area she's meant to go to and she'll just know but we give that uncertainty to you and we look for that that guidance that spiritual guidance amen thank you what do you want to what you were saying before too about the show banged up and abroad i felt like you kind of had summarized in a way too this parable would you would you mind reading for us a bit chris like we're up to we're actually the first line of the parable woe unto the world Woe unto the world because of offences, for, for it must needs be the offences come. Oh, down here, Chris, sorry. Woe unto the world because of offences. That's good. So I don't have my glasses. Um, <laughs> woe unto the world because of offences. Spiritual corruption and immaturity are the real causes of suffering in the third dimension. The hells and all their negative energy long to destroy the child of God. Thus, continual offences are thrown our way. The Lord wants us to be on guard against receiving or partaking in anything which is offensive to our spiritual life. Learning to fight and overcome negative states is the work of the soul warrior. And I feel that in a lot of ways this is missing from mainstream Christianity, this idea that we have a fight, a battle ahead of us, and it's not each other. Too often, too often we'll, we'll, we'll blame the external rather than realising the internal principles that are at work 
You know, be it the hell's, uh, be it my problem, be it the hell's problem, be it your spiritual problems. But it's, it's recognizing this is what the Lord's really saying about cutting hands off and cutting feet off and cutting eyes out. He's not talking about literal, literal hands, eyes. He's talking about their spiritual parallel. So let's go, let's look into that a bit. Let's dig into that. A bit more, Chris? Oh, you, you haven't got your glasses. Do you want to no, no, it's okay. I'm okay. For, for it must, must needs be that offences come. There can be no real growth or lasting victory without spiritual combat and temptation. <laughs> we can't get through this life without having battles. It's a part of, you know, it's a part of the process. So a little bit more for us. Yeah. That's the fun part, is it? Fun part. <laughs> I love it. I love your attitude. Do that man by whom the offence cometh. The most effective lies contain some truth. Yes, man in scripture is a representation of truth and woman goodness. So when the Lord says, woe to the man who, through whom the offence comes, what he's saying is, be aware that even truth could really be uh, a trap, one of those traps in that you were talking about from the enemy, that the enemy knows how to speak truth to us, but they do it with an energy that's not nice, you know? Like the Bible says, speak the truth in love and we will grow up into Christ. It's too easy to speak the truth at someone and really what you want to do is, is give them a good kick in the guts. I find it very difficult to do it in love. <laughs> Stop it. Behave yourself. Oh, okay. The way I think about trials is say like, I, someone wanted to be a, a carpenter and you didn't do your apprenticeship. It's how are you supposed to be angels or spirits when we don't have experience as a carpenter. Do you know what I mean? Like, so how? It's it's like an apprenticeship. That being an apprentice, well, as Russell would know, you start at the bottom and you've got all these responsibilities with no knowledge. So once you move your, your apprenticeship, you're able to teach other people and you can enrich. So when we're in the next life, but you're nailing it, Chris. This is the problem that Christy, you know, you come into Christianity or, or many spiritual practices and it's kind of like, throw you in the deep end of the pool. Good luck. You know, <laughs> it's like you don't do that. We're meant to have a discipleship type of, but I think in many ways, you know, there's that Harry Potter stories, you know, the one picks the, the wizard or whatever. I think in many ways, the young Christian should be finding mentors. You know, often you come into Christianity and, and then there'll be somebody standing saying, let me teach you. I don't want you teaching me. <laughs> let, let the younger ones find those that they can turn to for that apprenticeship. And let the elders who really have walked the path be willing to give their time and energy to, 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 to disciple those younger ones. Find a mentor, not a dictator. Ah! <laughs> find a mentor, not a dictator. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But we're going to get there, Chris. You keep, it's amazing how you do that. We, you keep sort of summarizing. We'll, you'll see when we get to the end. No, it's good. It's good. You're, you're, on, you're on the vein. You're really on the vein. It's good. Um, Paul, would you mind would you mind reading to us the next little bit? Sure, yeah. Is it wherefore, yeah, yes. wherefore thy hand or thy foot offend thee? The soul warrior is sensitive to the spirit of the Lord and towards anything that blocks one's spiritual life. Cut them off, learning not to give energy to any negative states or experiences and cast them from the activity resisting evil and selfish practices. I think that's meant to be actively, sorry, Act yeah. actively activity. resisting evil and selfish practices. Yeah. So the idea, what's the Lord really asking us to cut off here? Not our physical hand or foot or eye. What are we meant to cut off? It's the negative thoughts. The negative thoughts and the negative <sighs> feelings, isn't it? Don't feed them. Don't give energy to those negative thoughts and feelings. Is, isn't it true? You know, like, uh, someone taught me this years ago, and it so has helped me. Don't nurse it. Nursing it's when you're like, oh, why'd they have to pick on me? Why, you know, Kamal, why are people so unkind to me? You know, and that he's doing it in comedy. But the point is, don't nurse it. Too often we nurse it. Why me? Don't rehearse it. You ever done that one? Go over and over and ruminate. Okay? Don't nurse it. Don't rehearse it. Don't curse it. 
well, if they say that to me again, I'm going to say this next time and I'm going to do that. So don't nurse it, don't rehearse it, don't curse it, just disperse it. Oh, that's such, been such a helpful one just for me. Isn't it? <laughs> just disperse it. Catch yourself being caught in this trap, the soul trap. Give it no strength. Give it no energy and strength. Now, go back to the very first bit of the introduction. The nature of reality is such that pathways open before us based on our heart condition, our heart desires. Heart condition. So if you're nursing it, if you're rehearsing it, if you're cursing it, you are, you're joining with the divine to create more negative realities. Really. Absolutely. You really are. And the soul warrior understands the responsibility to say, I'm not playing this game anymore. I'm, I'm going I'm to play a different game. And that's where, you know, most of the soul warrior's weapons are defensive. You block it. Don't give it energy. Don't give it thought. Shield it. Are you okay, Christina? Do you need to? Do you need the bathroom or something? Or did you need you something? Okay? No. You have to go downstairs. Yeah. That's okay. That's fine. Right. So, shall we keep going, uh, Paul? Do you want a little bit more? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, where was I? It, it is better. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt all main. Even the smallest amount of goodness will grow forever. Rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire, partial goodness with conflict and challenges is infinitely preferable over unity and conformity within genuine, without genuine consent. Okay, so what I'm saying here is so often when we're, we're wanting to cut something off in your life, be it internally or externally, you're wanting to cut something off, the first thing that comes up for you is, what am I going to lose? Let's go right out to the externals. Let's say there's a loved one or a family member in your life that is really toxic. And you have to make the decision to pull back from them. The first thing that comes up in you is, what am I going to lose here? You know, I'm going to lose this and this and this and this and this. And the Lord's saying, better to lose something and still have life then to hold on to something and lose everything. That's kind of the principle that he's kind of getting out there. Okay, a bit more. Paul, you're really plowing us through it. It's good. Yeah, it's well now. Oh, d does Guan want to? Yeah, okay. Guan, do you want to? Oh, do you if I know an FND, the purpose of the eye is to behold what is divine. Block it out, spiritual practices that move the heart in an eye away from selfishness selfishness and towards love. And okay, so is the Lord is the Lord really wanting us to rip our eye out? Is that what he really wants? Well, if you're Muslim, they cut the hands off if you steal. So they take it literally. They do. I find that so tragic. I mean, that's, that's their way of doing things, but... Yes. What's that, sorry? Really? Christianity as well. Really? Oof. Even the... Jesuits or something, they self-flagellation where they whip themselves. Whip themselves and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So Tragic. The, yeah, the mystical point is still with us. Yes. Yeah, I mean if you if you if you literally cut someone's hand off, yeah. you've taken away their ability to reform. Yeah. Isn't it? You, you know, at least if the hand is still there and they've done wrong, and they may do wrong again a few more times, there needs to be that room for them to be able to, to re repent and reform. You still want to make them bitter about losing their hand then too. It's like then they're, oh, they cut my hand off, I hate them, instead of giving them a chance. Yeah, I know, it's, it's tough, isn't it? You know, th th this is such a good one to, for us to sort of say to our fundamentalist brothers and sisters that deny the deeper side of the spiritual word, well, how many times have you cut your hand off or plucked your eye out or, or, or chopped your foot off? Surely you know that's not the heart of the Lord. There's something deeper going on there. And of course the eye is meant to behold the divine. That's what we'll give in the eye to, to, to look around in life and enjoy and be in awe and in wonder of all that is good. 
how often do we do we find ourselves focusing in on the bad on each other or the negative and that's what the Lord's saying cut off cut that off don't focus in on the bad if you keep you know you'd be better to not see that person if you come away continually criticizing them all the time you know isn't it yeah okay so keep Guang, do you want to read some yes yes and cast and you see cast it out and cast yeah. it from me yeah. ah. oh, okay. and cast it from the spiritual love is grieved and uh, repulsed by self selfishness negativity and evil okay so the real solution the real solution to all of this am i learning to love what is godly more Am I actually developing a repulsion for what is negative? That's the real work. You know, if I'm still really liking, you see someone's coming up to me and gossiping and criticizing, telling me all these bad things about someone, and I'm really liking that, that's the root problem. That's what I've got to deal with. You know, wasn't it Socrates, wasn't it Socrates or one of these famous uh, um, scholars, someone came to tell him bad news and he stopped them and said, uh, before you tell me this, let me do the, lit the, the test. He did three things, and it, and, and it was, is it good information? Is it going to help me if I know this? And there's some other third one as well. And by the end of the test, is they're like... Is it good? Is it true? Is it necessary? Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. So good to have him here, isn't it? <laughs> is it good? Am I going to find something good about this? Is, is it true? true? Is okay. it necessary? Is it necessary? And if, if it's still all those things after, tell, uh, after that test, then tell me about this person. Didn't Jesus say something about gossip also? Oh, yeah, somewhere the next day, he said something about gossip. It's just, I've read it somewhere. Uh, James. Is James, the book of James? It's like James. Mm. You know what he did say, though, which like, like ties in? Whatever you speak in secret, it's going to be shouted from a rooftop. <laughs> so if you're talking, if I'm... Hey, come, come, come here, Russell. Let me tell you something about Chris. You know, if it's not something I want Chris to ever hear, then I shouldn't say it at all, mm. ever. That's right. Yeah. So is that pretty. It's Leviticus as well. Leviticus. Don't go up and down being a tail bearer. Tail bearer. Tail bearer. Telling yeah. stories. Telling Going stories. Up and down telling stories. Mm. Yeah, Proverbs have a lot to do it, you know. That ruins Hollywood, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, Holly weird? Did you say? Sorry. <laughs> Hollywood. Yes. Okay. Um, so, Doctor. Uh, so, Guang. Okay. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes, to be cast into hell fire. Divine providence seeks to bless every aspect of our lives, physical, mental, and spiritual. And again, I put that note there to say, when we're saying no to something. We have to trust that providence has something better. You know, Jesus said it this way to his disciples. If you've given up homes, families, income for my sake, you will receive all of these things in the next life and in this life. That's actually what he said, and in this life. So the Lord's not trying to take stuff from us. He's trying to bless us. So anything that he's asking us to give up, He's not trying to take it, he actually wants to bless us. And that's a trust that we've got to have. I'm yeah, I'm into that. Ian, do you want to read a little or do you want to jump to Trevor? Trevor, do you want to read the next? No? Do you want to read, darling? Would you like to read or your mum or? Do you want to read something? You're the only one here who doesn't need glasses to read. <laughs> Maybe mum. <laughs> We're... Eyes to see. Yeah, she has eyes Everyone to see. All of us have glasses, but. <laughs> Am I putting you guys on the spot? Sorry. Having eyes to see. How do we open our spiritual eyes? Meditation, perhaps. But there must be set principles to guide us forward. The about spiritual eyes are to open. The eyes search for and seek for that which the heart craves. Why would we want our spiritual eyes to be open? What are we seeking? Is it power and fulfillment, or is it insight? Or might we be seeking for the Lord? Yes, it is to see the Lord, the creator and lover of our soul. We seek our Heavenly Father. That is the deepest longing of the newly awakened soul. Any thoughts on that, people? That was beautiful, thank you. Any thoughts on that, people? If you are newly awakened, and I try to make every day a new awakening for me. I'm such an infinite, uh, uh, 
uh, what, uh, what is the expression? I'm, I'm still new. I'm still learning all of this. You know what I mean? And will for all eternity. If we're a newly awakened soul, that ache we have inside us is actually to reconnect with our Heavenly Father, isn't it, Chris? You know, earthly fathers are good. I miss my dad. I really do. But ultimately, it's my creator that I'm longing for, that I'm really missing. And I've got to remember that. Keep, keep going, Dal. That's right. Now think about this from a different angle. Would it be enough to see the Lord with your natural eyes? Many souls walked the earth at the time of the Lord's incarnation and saw him with their physical eyes. Many were also not impressed with what they saw. These individuals beheld love itself manifesting in time and space, but the vision of him was filtered through the unregenerate, unregenerate ego. Our lower ego will always distort what our eyes see. Images coming into the mind will be shrouded in sensual desires. The lower ego is driven by its own fulfillment and every sens sensual encounter mutates into an opportunity to take rather than give. Thoughts on that? Think about, you know, the Hollywood of your mind. Think about all the movies that go on inside your mind. And we all have them. And uh, was it Luther who said, birds might fly in the air, but don't, you don't have to let them land on your head and build a nest and make nests. You know? That's fascinating because birds spiritually sim symbolize thoughts. We all have movies and pictures running in our head. But you know, the ones we hold on to are the ones that are dearest to us. <laughs> I think we hold on to the dearest pictures. So, so the Lord is saying here, be aware of what's going on in your mind's eye. That's what you've got to pluck out. What do you imagine yourself doing with your spare time and your energy? That's your hand and your feet. Where would you like to go if you had all the power of the world? Where would you go? What would you be doing right now? On the beach? Sipping a martini or something? I don't know. I'd be here. You'd be here. Oh, thank you. Oh, that makes my heart happy, Chris. That makes my heart happy. Yeah, so it, it, it's not to say we all have a mixture. Please, I'm not judging anyone here. We all have a mixture. There are times where, you know, that person was really, really rude. I was pulled over on the side of the road because my car was having an issue. Yes, believe it or not, Teslas have issues. And I, I had nowhere to pull over on the freeway, so I pulled over into this area where trucks go into to weigh their stuff. So I pulled over way off the highway and some four-wheel drive driving past with all their camping gear with a P on it and the teenager says, oh yeah, you know, and uses all sorts of expletives. Moron, that's not a place to park. And I'm thinking, I have nowhere else to park. But it's amazing how in you is that energy to want to find a baseball bat. <laughs> what would I do with a baseball bat? I mean, but you know what I mean, you, you want to run, run up beside them and say, I had problems with my car, but it's, it's not the point. Can we let it go? That's the challenge. Let it go. That's the cutting off of the foot. That's the cutting off of the hand. That's the cutting off of the eye. Don't let that holy, that holy weird run around in your head any longer. The story where you get them back. <laughs> you get revenge. Don't watch that movie anymore. Push it out. That's the path to real peace and real happiness. Or let's say the picture that your head keeps bringing up, and it's evil spirits, is where you fail. Where you suck. Where you're terrible. You're nobody. Nobody likes you. Go and eat worms. You've got, you've got to realize you are loved. You are loved. There is only one you. You are loved. And you push that movie away and come back to the story that says you are loved. Love so much that the divine himself stepped down and took form among us to show us how loved we are. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, that's so beautiful. Do you mind reading a little bit more? Yeah. I love the innocence oh. that comes through when she's reading. Isn't it lovely? Therapeutic. It's therapeutic. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It really is. Yeah, the heart of a child. Mm. Equally important, I think, isn't it? Equally important is the nature of the physical world. It is the world of correspondences, meaning that all physical objects take a form that symbolically represents the spiritual principles. Thus, our minds, when led forth by selfish and corrupt desires, will always interject veils that distort reality into our image or into the image of our lust. When the heart is purified and set free from the lower ego, then our spiritual eyes can truly be opened, and we can behold the Lord with ever-increasing clarity. Thus, the 
further we journey along the tree path, the more visible the Lord becomes to our mind and soul, as highlighted in the sacred text. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause them to fall. For they eat the bread of, wick of wickedness, and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. How beautiful the Lord. Mm. You know, if we're on the right path, mm -hmm. we're going to have some dark times. We're going to find those movies in our head carrying us away. Mm -hmm. But the Lord promises us if we just keep going, our path will get brighter and brighter and brighter and what that means is that like I look at my brother here and I see the Lord I see the Lord in his heart or my sister or my or, or their beautiful daughter I see the Lord more and more I'm, I'm I'm getting less and less distracted by evil and hell and there's plenty of it out there there's plenty to be distracted by and I'm seeing the divine hand of the Lord at work isn't that a wonderful thought to think that we're going to have times of getting distracted, but if we keep going on the path, Jesus has promised us that he is the light, and if we walk in the light, we're going to see him more and more and more. And I found when I get glimpses of the Lord, I can't help but fall in love with him. Really. I don't have to try and love the Lord and my neighbor. It's like, oh, wow. What love. What perfection. What sacrifice. What selflessness. It's just beautiful and it's inspiring. So that's, that's the promise of the Lord for us. Cut it off, whatever it is. It's only going to get in your way. Hobble the rest of the path if you have to with a crutch. Hobble along with a crutch. At least you're in the light. At least you're seeing him and you're moving closer and closer. What's so, people say to me is that you use this religion that you do as a crutch. I go, yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> and it works for me. Yeah. So if it helps me walk, helps me carry on, yeah, I do use it as a crutch. Well, you know, to quote John Wimber, the, the father of the vineyard movement, when someone said that to him, he said, a crutch? No way, the Lord is my stretcher. Mm. <laughs> he said, the Lord is my stretcher. Carry, carry. He's just carrying me. A, a crutch means I'm doing good, you know. Like, no, he's just, isn't that, isn't that peace to think you're being carried along? And carry on. Okay, so that was beautiful. Thank you, darling. Thank you, Shauna. So in conclusion, and this is coming back to what you kept saying too, uh, Chris, soul warriors, us, we're soul warriors. We are called to build bridges for ourselves, but for others too. Think of people who are stuck in darkened minds, darkened negativity, darkened states. They need a way, they need a bridge out of that darkness in their head. So we're being called to build bridges and highways so that others may find the path that leads to the Lord. Although we may try again and again, nothing else can truly satisfy the soul like a relationship with the divine. We may temporarily fill the void with TV shows or sports or the latest news. We may find solace when we fill the emptiness with food, sex and money. But in the end, material energy, stuff, it's just stuff, will not complete our soul. There are things the body needs in this life, and there are things also, uh, there are also things the soul needs too. Only the great spirit can fill and fulfill our spirit. Blind, empty, and hungry, we need those, that's us needing an we need an apprenticeship, don't we, um, Chris? We need an apprenticeship. Blind, empty, and hungry, we need those who can show us the path. The sacred duty of the soul warrior is to guard that path and make it visible to those seeking the way. So I don't know about you, I, mean, I love this life. I love this life that the Lord's given me. And I don't mean stuff, I mean you people. I love this life that I have friends, I have, we have fellowship, we have spiritual things, we have community, we have purpose. We have a destiny beyond this body. I love that. But equally, I would happily get off this planet at any second. Equal, I would love to get off this planet at any second because of the horrors that are in it. But my desire to be here with you and to help and to serve is far, far stronger than my desire to be out of here. And so I take it, I really do, I take this as a task. 
I'm going to be a soul warrior. I'm going to build bridges. I'm going to build highways for me, for my family, for you, for whoever can to help them find the Lord so that their time in this planet can be joyous and exciting. And they can also have a part of them that says, I'm also equally happy to move on as well. Amen to that? Amen to that. Any last thoughts, questions? We went a little over, but that's okay. Does, does anybody, how are, we, how are we thinking and feeling? Yes, but very quickly, if you ever want to pray for Sarah and I. Sure. It's, a, it's a, we are a bit of a struggling, you know. You know that the Dr. Ian, and we leading him uh, for seven years to door. He attending our and uh, but, but anyway, cut long story. In the beginning of this year, he said he would be a bit baptized before Christmas. So now <laughs> it's a weird. Okay. And then he is uh, saying that uh, uh, again, you know. Too busy, too busy, too busy, being a, a stretch, stretch, so long. And quite a number of years so far. But this is the kind of we are seeing the final, the, the time. It, it, uh, but he continued to do that. And uh, I kind of feel we've been, we've been cheated, or we've been, uh, you know, we see that. And because we then we are doing many good things for him. Mm. You know, but anyway, cut a long story short, we were actually seeing that we actually, it's not a, sounds like a criticizing anything, but just to build up the, a bridge mm. or just build a highway mm. in order for him or those or his family to go through us, to go into the Lord. Mm -hmm. So how we can doing that continuously, which is uh, it because of a lot of time, energy. Money. Well, the, the scriptures are very clear to, 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 yeah, to, so to not can. faint. It says, this is the real challenge, isn't it? It's to, it's to get challenge. exhausted and tired and say, we've tried. And but it says, if you do not faint, you will reap a harvest. That's the promise of the scripture, isn't it? Yeah. So we should be praying that you don't get tired, you don't get faint, uh, you don't get burnt out. Yeah, burnt out. Don't and get burnt and out. And yeah. And sometimes we say, oh, if <laughs> sometimes I don't know whether it's uh, in our theory, we talk about if the Lord not really preparing <laughs> for so and so, then why we have to be that much. Mm. No, you so know. <laughs> you want him to become wheat and not a tear. So this is the way I, parables for me are the way I explain. And so wheat is nutritious, it's filling. Tear pretends it's, it's wow. nutritious and filling, yeah. but it's not. No. Wouldn't you want to be filling someone instead of pretending to? I don't know, that's how I think with parables with, with, with people and I think we've got to become nutritious but don't you want to be nutritious and become wheat also? Mm. I don't know, that's just... It's good Chris, that's good. Shall we pray for this and then we'll close the, the meeting? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Dear Lord, um, we all link our faith together with Sean and Sarah and Shauna. We link our faith with theirs now and we say, Lord, your word promises us that if we keep sowing, we keep showing, and we keep growing that you will bring that harvest, Lord. Even as Leviticus 26 says, that the rain will come and we will we will not just reap the fruit, but the, the, the fruit will keep coming and the press and the wine and the grains will be full. There'll be such blessing, Lord. So we just ask that, that for Sean, Sarah and Shauna, that you, re you continue to renew their energy and strength. They do it because it's good and it's right. But let their heart be at peace. They will see that fruit. And Lord, you are doing providential work for this Dr. Ian. We don't know all that's at work, but we trust that you, you do have uh, a reason and a timing. Let his heart come, Lord. Let him delay no longer. Let him come to you and know you and find that peace 
that he might help those that he has contact with to find peace too. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, we spent time in your word today. I pray that we go encouraged, strengthened, that it stays in our heart, and that we too can be your warriors, fighting for love and goodness and truth, shining a light in a dark place, and giving people hope. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Me. Yeah. So we should do tea and coffee and, yeah. and those kind of things? Coffee for sure. Yeah. Yeah.